good evening, everyone. It's a delight to be over here in Minneapolis, and thank you so much to Mayflower Church. If you will, I'm an emissary from the city of St. Paul. I'm a resident of St. Paul. Any St. Paulites in the room? Thank you. I'd love to talk at the Q&A after Gail talks about Minneapolis, what St. Paul is doing, too. Uh, I am with a private nonprofit organization called Fresh Energy, which happens to be based also in St. Paul, but works throughout the state of Minnesota and the region of the Midwest, and also on federal policy. The heart of our work is based on the, our formation in 1991 by a group of 60 concerned Minnesota citizens who got together at a retreat at the Wilder Forest, if you remember that lovely location. And these were citizens who were concerned in the fall of 1991 that even at that point, the United States was at war, at least partially over oil, and Minnesota was completely dependent on fossil fuels from other places with no energy plan to ever improve things. And those citizens, this was well before my time at doing the work, those citizens, to their credit, said, Minnesota has a wealth of wonderful conservation and environmental organizations, but Minnesota does not have an organization that's focused on energy policy advocacy to get us the strong rules and regulations and laws we need to move in a better direction. So we are energy wonks, and we divide our work into um, clean and efficient transportation and buildings clean energy and electricity and energy efficiency, and global warming solutions, which is what I head up. And our focus is on shifting Minnesota and making a transition faster and faster to a healthier energy environment based on clean, efficient sources of energy that also keep more of our energy dollars in our own pockets or in our own local economies, rather than sending them to other places to buy dirty sources of energy. That's not acceptable to us. I'm going to start out with a slide from Dr. John Holdren, who is normally a professor at Harvard University. Um, he is taking a leave of absence to be President Obama's science advisor. And this is a slide that actually he created, and I'm using by, with permission, to point out, to remind us all what things, what broad list of things are affected by climate, and that all of those things are at more risk as the climate changes, as Dr. Seeley has described. And take a look at this list. The reason I'm in this business is for human beings and the things that we cherish and love about this earth. And look at this list. And I would be hard pressed to find anyone, no matter how conservative they are about this issue of climate change, who does not care about the availability of clean food and water. Top, top two things on the list. Or you might care specifically about ocean acidification. Or you might be concerned about loss of entire species if we continue burning these fossil fuels. Or you might be concerned about medical geography and the geography of disease. There are lots of human scale reasons to be very concerned about climate change. And the way we look at it is, this is a set of risks that are not acceptable. And the way we deal with risks in our country and in our communities is through insurance. We insure against all kinds of risks. We take steps to reduce our exposure to those risks. And the type of extreme weather that Mark Seeley was talking about, I call expensive weather. <laughs> it is expensive weather. And it is expensive in human lives, and it is expensive in our economy. And I speak, sometimes you can tell from my voice, I've been in Minnesota a long time, but I'm from New York. And all of my family, except one who lives in Texas, still live in New York. And I remember talking to my parents, my elderly parents, when they were living with one of my sisters for six days because they did not have power and they were 50 miles away from the storm. Um, and their son-in-law works for Consolidated Edison, Con Ed. <laughs> so you can bet they had interesting dinner conversations. Uh, but we know that there are human scale um, economic risks here. And so that's what we're trying to solve. Now, to be honest with you, if I did not believe that there are many things that we can do and are already doing in Minnesota to address this problem of climate change, I would be back at home in St. Paul right now. <laughs> but there are a wealth of things that are happening around us and much more that we can do to address this problem, but we need to get very busy. Now, we do still encounter, and I work 
recently until midnight last night at the state legislature. You just do encounter at the legislature a little more than in last year, I think, a little less than last year, excuse me, um, those people who think that there's nothing that humans could do to change the climate of the earth. And what I like to do is refer people to compendiums of scientific analyses of this. And this is one of them. This is one of my favorite. Um, if you remember last year, maybe one of your favorite movies was one of my favorite movies, Lincoln. And I like reading about Abraham Lincoln um, in part because I know that what he was doing in 1863 and 1864, apart from what was described in that movie, is he was actually founding the National Academy of Sciences. So he was busy with other big things, but he also had a problem that the current president has, which he had um, a Congress that was formed mostly not of medical doctors or scientists or engineers, but even in 1863, there were a number of scientific and medical and engineering problems that Congress at that time needed to address. And so he founded a scientific advisory board, the blue ribbon gold standard of scientists. You have to be elected to the National Academy of Sciences. And they're still around. And so this group, about every year, gets asked by our current Congress, is this climate change thing really happening? And this is what they happen to say in May of 2011, They're, and I'll let you read this statement. This is not a fly-by-night organization. It's not part of a hoax. Founded in 1863 by President Lincoln, um, kind of a risk-averse organization, the National Academy of Sciences, and they're saying climate change is caused by human activities, it's occurring, it's a growing threat to society, and we need to control greenhouse gas emissions now. So let's get busy. Where is, I'm going to start by talking to you about where Minnesota is on our clean energy path. And I'm going to start not too far back, about six years ago in 2007. In 2007, the Minnesota legislature, in a strong bipartisan fashion, after about seven years of strong advocacy by Fresh Energy and many individuals around Minnesota and many organizations, passed three policies that are instrumental in putting us on the clean energy path. A big part of them was something called, I think, a very well-named law, the Next Generation Energy Act. What is the future that we're leaving for the next generation? So it includes energy saving goals for our electric utilities and our natural gas utilities that they are all meeting. They're meeting the minimum goals and they could, some of them could push a little harder and get to the one and a half percent goals per year, every year. We should expect them just like we expect our kids to get better and better every year. We should expect our electric utilities and their air emissions to get better and better every year. And so far they are because of state law. Secondly, and this was the sexy part of that Next Generation Energy Act, the Renewable Energy Standard, also called the RES, that called for most of the utilities in the state to get to at least 25% new renewable energy by 2025, and for Excel Energy to get to at least 30% renewable energy by 2020. Every utility in the state is on track to meet these goals, and in fact, they're meeting them ahead of schedule. And so they're about two-thirds of the way through that process. And I'll talk in a minute about what we're trying to do at the legislature now. The third thing was more iffy. Think about this. Did you know Minnesota has science-based limits on global warming pollution? Hotly debated in the 2007 legislature. Um, we brought in scientists, many of them from the University of Minnesota and fine private institutions around this state and other places. We brought in um, experts from the military. We brought in experts who were concerned about health care. We brought in experts who were um, from the faith communities. And all of these voices were talking about the need to listen to what science was saying and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. When that law passed, I think my next slide is what it does. Here are those carbon reduction goals for Minnesota based on the 2005 benchmark. Let's take a look at that. At least 15% below those levels by 2015 which is coming right up, and ultimately at least 80% below those levels by 2050. So those are the, that's the goal of the state of Minnesota. The other thing that was hotly debated in 2007 was the legislature put a provision into that law that I call the, the first law of holes, which I stole from former Governor Tim Pawlenty, because back in 2006 and 2007, when he was a champion of climate change action in Minnesota, he said, 
there's kind of a first law of holes, that when you realize you're in a hole and you've got a carbon problem, the first rule is to stop digging and before you can climb out of that hole. And the way that manifests itself in the climate problem is, as you're trying to achieve these science-based but very deep reductions, you can't at the same time be adding to the problem. So here, the current issue right now in the nation is the Keystone XL pipeline. Of course, we can't be adding that set of problems to our carbon budget. Back when this law was passed, and still, the point of conflict was whether Minnesota would buy or generate even more coal-fired power without offsetting the carbon emissions. And so what the legislature passed in a strong bipartisan fashion was a provision of the law that said no Minnesota utility can buy or build new coal generation unless they offset 100% of the carbon emissions. Now, shortly after that, the state of North, Deso North Dakota sued the state of Minnesota, and that lawsuit is still active, because they didn't like the idea of their neighbor and their electric customer telling them what kind of electricity we wanted. We wanted clean, carbon-free electricity. So we think we'll win that lawsuit, um, but that is the law of the state of Minnesota. Now, if you're going to make 80% reductions in greenhouse gases, you better have a very clear-eyed view of where those emissions are coming from, because you want to be successful. And so this is a set of pie charts that looks at Minnesota on the left and the US on the right. And for people who can't read it, I'll tell you what it says. First of all, Minnesota and the US are pretty similar, except that we're a farm state, so our agriculture emissions are, are higher, about twice the national average. The important takeaway here is twofold. First of all, we have many sources of carbon pollution or greenhouse gas emissions. So anyone who tells you that any one thing, whether it's solar power or wind power or hydropower or um, better buildings is going to solve the problem is wrong. We need dozens of different solutions. And Gail Press is going to talk, be talking to you about some of the dozens of solutions that the city of Minneapolis is focused on to address this multivariate problem. So bear that in mind. There's no simple solution. We need to work in a lot of sectors. But that also means we need a lot of creative, bright people who have a lot of background. So there's a lot of work to be done. Secondly, the number one source of global warming pollution is not SUVs. <laughs> the number two source of global warming pollution is transportation. But the number one source in Minnesota and the US is burning coal to produce electricity. So if that's the one takeaway you have from tonight, that is what most what we need to change in this state. But fortunately, we are on that path to making that change. Here's where a lot of our coal comes from, the Powder River Basin um, in Wyoming. And as you can imagine, there's no pipeline that comes there, but there is a pipeline called a system of trains that is bringing that coal to Minnesota. Um, in the case of our biggest power plant, I think 30,000 tons of coal a, a day are burned. And so we've got, um, we've got a big trade relationship with the state of Wyoming, and we've got a big emissions relationship as well. The reason to transition away from coal, the heart of it is that we don't have any coal, and that coal is very bad for human health. So causes about 21,000 premature deaths every year in this country, and these are the types of um, substances it emits. I'll give you that list there. And so we need to move away from that. So I mentioned this renewable energy standard that we're on track to meet in Minnesota. Before we had the renewable energy standard, you can look at our fraction of coal greater than the national average, more coal dependent than the national average, even though we don't have any coal for various historic reasons. And then the pie really changes between 2000 and 2010 as that renewable energy standard took effect. And the wedge that is blue, or teal, if you look at it, is renewable energy. And that was primarily wind power because that's the most cost-effective source of renewable energy. And you should start with the cheapest source of renewables first. So we've been backing down on coal and growing renewable energy. And we're diversifying our energy portfolio. That's always a good thing. However, if, any, if your investment manager were looking at this and that 51% coal were one particular stock in your portfolio, I bet that person would say that you should di diversify further. And that is what we need to do in Minnesota. 
Here is what has happened in Minnesota as a result of that renewable energy standard. We are number four in the country in wind per capita. <laughs> and when I heard that we were number four, I wanted to immediately, because I'm a geographer by training, I wanted to know who are number one, two, and three. And it turns out that it's the upper Midwest, the Saudi Arabia of wind. Now, a lot of that wind is coming from the Dakotas. We're buying it from the Dakotas. We're happy to buy it from the Dakotas, um, rather than buying coal from the Dakotas, um, to serve Minnesota as well. But there's something happening in the upper Midwest that recognizes that we have another thing that we can do with our land that actually generates um, lease payments to landowners, property tax revenues, um, to counties that really need them in western and southern Minnesota and are paying for libraries and roads and schools and are generating in Minnesota now about 3,000 jobs in the wind industry. So it's been a big success story for Minnesota. But our work is not done. We still have this health problem from burning coal. And I turn to my partners at the American Lung Association because they have been acting working very actively on this. And I know downstairs, I think the Minnesota Public Health Association has a table with some of this information as well. That climate change is linked to worse air quality that makes people who have respiratory problems and cardiovascular problems suffer more. So there's a reason in Minnesota to be concerned. Mark mentioned the incidence of pollen and more allergies because of higher CO2 and temperature. And then in Minnesota, we have um, an epidemic of asthma and more asthma attacks are triggered when we have high ozone days, high heat waves in Minnesota. So there's a reason based on our health that we should be concerned about this problem. What can we do about that? And now I'm gonna to switch to federal action. Now there's been a lot of discussion after the president's inaugural address and then his State of the Union address, in both of which he mentioned climate change. And you may have mentioned he was referring a little bit obliquely to um, what Congress should be doing on a bipartisan basis, and that he was tired of uh, getting tired of waiting for them to take that action, and that there were things that he could do on an administrative level in, their in their, the absence of their action. Clean Air Act. Does anyone remember the first Earth Day, 1970? On the first, shortly after the first Earth Day, um, President, Republican President Richard Nixon signed into law the Clean Air Act. And the Clean Air Act, the main provisions there are about protecting human health and welfare. And it relies on the best science and allows emerging science to help guide the Environmental Protection Agency that when it finds that a particular pollutant is damaging human health and welfare, the EPA is obliged to take action to limit that pollutant. So, um, the EPA um, actually updated the, uh, excuse me, the Congress actually updated the Clean Air Act in 1990. And the story here that's important is of 100 U.S. Senators, 89 of them voted for the updated Clean Air Act. And in Minnesota, our congressional delegation was 10 members at that time, five Republican, five Democrats. All 10 of them voted to upgrade the Clean Air Act. And so, um, what President Obama is referring to is action Congress took 43 years ago that allows it now that, it ha that the EPA has identified carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions as damaging human health and welfare, allows the EPA to set limits on carbon pollution from power plants. So that's what needs to happen now. next. I'm going to skip those few. So what needs to happen in the future for Minnesota and for our congressional delegation? Uh, I'm going to skip that one. We need to take our renewable energy standard, which we have seen is a working model, and we are actually, Fresh Energy has helped form a campaign in Minnesota of 35 organizations, labor, faith, youth, conservation, more than 100 businesses and environmental organizations called the Clean Energy and Jobs Campaign, and we are moving and helping to support legislators move a set of legislation that includes strengthening the renewable energy standard to get to 40% by 2030, to get to 10% solar energy by 2030, so add those together, 50% renewable energy by 2030, and that will allow us to deploy these new technologies and create more jobs in Minnesota. If we had a 10% solar energy standard in Minnesota, in the first year, 
it would generate 2,000 new jobs in Minnesota. We know that people love solar. Um, but we also need, remember those carbon reduction goals in Minnesota? We need a workable plan to meet them. And one way that the federal government can help is this. In 2013, the EPA needs to finalize standards that were already proposed a year ago for which they got 3.4 million public comments in support, an unprecedented number of public comments in support, to limit carbon for the first time from new power plants. We expect that the Obama administration will propose standards for existing power plants for the first time to limit carbon dioxide from existing power plants. Think of it this way. We used the Clean Air Act, and over the years, we regulated lead in our air and water because it was getting into our kids' brains. We regulated arsenic. We've recently regulated mercury from power plants. And the idea is, as a society, we continue to improve and our air gets better. Unfortunately, a recent nationwide survey last, done last month showed that 57% of Americans really think this idea of carbon limits on power plants is a good idea. It's so obvious that 57% of Americans think it already exists. And this is the other takeaway. There are no limits on the carbon that can come out of power plants. Our biggest power plant in Minnesota emits 13.2 million metric tons of carbon dioxide a year. It's the number one source of global warming pollution. It's the Sherco plant. So as you're calculating your carbon footprint, it's probably something like mine in the single number of tons. It's not 13.2 million metric tons. So it's part of the problem we need to address. What we're asking you to do tonight is come down to the fresh energy table and take a postcard that looks like this. Sign them. We will deliver them to your legislators in a block, and it will help them move the legislation that is actually now in process in the legislature. And in the q and I'd be happy to talk about that going forward. And I want to just give a shout out to some of my um, um, comrade groups who are downstairs. Um, Fresh Energy is part of a climate action campaign with Environment Minnesota and the Sierra Club North Star chapter. And they are both downstairs. I think their tables are right together. They are um, taking petitions to President Obama asking for these climate actions. And then Transit for Livable Communities is also down there. Another campaign that Minis uh, Minnesotans are supporting is called Transit for a Stronger Economy. And you can fill out a postcard that looks like this, Transit for a Stronger Economy. So it's not, I've been focusing my comments on electricity, but obviously it's also about transportation too. Um, yeah, there, well, there are going to be many hearings coming up, so you, you need to stay involved. And what you can do is you can go to Fresh Energy's website. We will always have a take action page so you can know how you can plug in and make a difference. And you can do it through our website. You can also go to the cleanenergyjobs.mn website to find out what is happening. I mentioned Earth Day before. I just want to close with this. Earth Day is, and I love Earth Day because it's my birthday. <laughs> But um, Earth Day is also April 22nd, and this year, I think this is almost firm, this year there will be a major clean energy and jobs rally at the Capitol to move forward clean energy legislation. So set aside Earth Day Monday, April 22nd for that, and I look forward to our next speakers. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here. This is just phenomenal. I've been working with the League of Women Voters Minneapolis on this for five years now, and each year it just gets to be better and better and better. So for one of the first most beautiful spring days for coming here tonight is just phenomenal. So thanks again for being here. So yep, I'm Gail Prest, and I'm lucky enough to live in the city for 25 years and work for the city of Minneapolis for about 12 years now, um, primarily on environmental issues. So tonight I'm going to tell you a little bit about historically what the city's greenhouse gas emissions are. Jay talked to us about what's happening at the state and then what we've been doing to reduce these emissions, talking about our climate change goals that the city council has adopted. We have something called the climate action plan. I want to tell you about it and I need your support and then really spend some time talking about what you can do. But first, why should the city take action? And Jay and Dr. Seeley did a great job. But as we all know, it's real and it's a threat, so we need to do something. And as was mentioned, 
Lowering greenhouse gas emissions is really good for the city. It's about air quality. It's about a city that's walkable, that's bikeable. Um, it's about less pollution. Um, it's actually where people want to live. You know, big urban cities are growing now, and frankly, um, the suburbs aren't always growing as fast. And, of course, this is really about our future. I mean, I think what we're doing now is important, but I think it's really looking at 20, 30 years from now, and what kind of legacy do we want to use, do we want to leave for our children and our grandchildren? Actually, Minneapolis, we have some tools we can use. So Jay talked about the federal level and the state level, but there's things here that we can do in the city, and I'm lucky enough to work for um, a mayor and city council members that aren't afraid to use those tools. And um, one of the things that we're finding is I work with sustainability directors for large cities all across the country, and we're finding that if we can drive change at the city level, we can convince change at the state and the federal level. And so that's really, really important. So we actually think what we're doing here in Minneapolis can affect what's happening across the country. So a little bit about the city's greenhouse gas inventory. So there's this science on how cities do it. And it's a little bit than, different than how states do it. But here's real quick, we've been measuring it from 2006 to, actually we have 2011 numbers, and I'll talk about those in a, in a bit. But as Jay said, it's all about electricity, a little bit about natural gas and roads. And waste is about 4%. So when you really look at it by sector, buildings are where it's at. And of course, buildings are electricity, i.e. coal and natural gas. Um, and when it comes to buildings, commercial and industrial buildings are really what we should be thinking about. Transportation is important. Um, and then, as I mentioned, waste is a little bit. Airport travel is some. But if you're only going to have, uh, really looking at what we're going to do, this is where we want to focus on, is the commercial and residential buildings and roads. But before we can start talking to the community about what's happening, I think it's important that the city show that we're walking the talk. And as Councilmember Glidden mentioned, the city's been doing a phenomenal job of reducing our own greenhouse gas emissions, thanks to some really strong Councilmember policies on green buildings, green fleets. We actually um, received a fair amount of federal stimulus dollars and we applied for them. And so we've done a lot of energy efficiency work. Uh, we actually track all the vehicles and how often they're used and should we be selling them off and what kind of things that we should be buying in place of them so you're not seeing police cars in Crown Victorias anymore. They're in much more efficient vehicles. And you know what? We've avoided six million dollars. So this isn't just good for carbon. This isn't just good for air pollution. This is saving the city money. Um, we're testing all sorts of new solar. Uh, for a while, we had some of the largest solar in the state, but we've got seven buildings that have solar PV. We're really happy to tour and give people the information on them so that they can look and see how it works. We're doing solar thermal on some of our fire stations, and we have one large geothermal system. Uh, if you, anybody here ever been to the Hiawatha Maintenance Facility off of Hiawatha? A few hands. Not the most exciting building. It's a public works building, but you know what? That building... We brought it in time and on budget, and we made it a LEED Platinum certified building, the highest LEED rating there is, which was just phenomenal. <laughs> and when the council set the budget, the council set the budget and then told staff they had to make it LEED. <laughs> so, you know, everybody says, oh, it costs too much to make a green building. Well, we proved them wrong. So, uh, you saw the one chart on the city's greenhouse gas emissions. Well, here's where we're at. And uh, the city did adopt a goal, and it's the same goal as the state. We want to all be consistent here. And it's 15% by 2015 and 30% by 2025. We're using 2006 as a baseline, not 2005, because that's where we could get the best data. Um, if you look, we've had some dramatic drops in the first few years. 50% um, of this was due to Excel Energy adding a lot more natural gas, switching from coal to natural gas, and adding a lot more wind. When we look, when Excel has given us their projections for the future, that kind of rapid change isn't going to happen unless the state, federal, uh, state legislative changes come through. So we're going to have to try others. Actually, in 2011, our greenhouse gas emissions went up a little bit, so it's probably only 11% decrease since 2006, and that's primarily because um, 
while the electricity, the amount of electricity the city used went down, the uh, Excel, the carbon emissions, the carbon intensity for when you switch on a light actually went up. So what is the city doing? We set these goals, great, go sit in a corner, good job for Minneapolis. That's not the way we do business in Minneapolis. So it was kind of like, okay, let's talk about how we're gonna meet these goals. So starting in early 2012, and Dr. Seeley came and was the feature speaker um, in kicking us off, and we had the mayor there, Jay was there, we embarked on the climate action plan. And so what we're trying to do is provide specific goals and strategies on how we're gonna meet that 30% reduction by 2025. And this is not a plan that we're gonna stick on the shelf. The mayor and, and Councilmember Glidden are saying, this is a roadmap, this is an action plan, this is not a study. Um, we've involved so many people, and you can participate, we've had public meetings, you can comment online, we have stakeholder groups. And what's really interesting is that this isn't unique. 140 cities have implemented climate action plans, so we actually have some really good data as to how to make this work. But part of doing a climate action plan and having a community involved is so that you all understand that we all have a role and that you can be supportive as we move forward. So uh, who here is on the climate action plan or went to a meeting? I can see some of you in the room. A few of you, yep, there in the back, thanks a lot. So we have four different steering groups, and then we have, or we have four different working groups, and then we have a steering group, broken out by the major sectors that we talked about um, before. So we're just in the draft stage, so this is really important for you all. Um, we hope to bring this to the council in April or May, and I'll talk a little bit later about what kind of support I'm gonna need from you. So listen carefully and think about, you know, whether this makes sense. There's plenty of opportunities to still comment and get involved. So building an energy, if you remember, it was 64, percent of our greenhouse gas emissions. So this is a huge area that we've got to tackle. I'm only going to talk about the goals now. We've got strategies under all of them, but I just want to hit the high level, and this is all online. So we want to achieve in the next 12 years, 12 years, a 15 percent energy efficiency in our buildings, 20 percent in the commercial, and we want a lot more not wind so much in southern Minnesota, but we want it right here in the city because that's where we think the jobs are at. Yeah, and so 5% is actually a lot, a lot. Um, as Councilmember Glidden mentioned, one of the things that we've already done, we didn't even wait for the climate action plan to get through, we implemented last, gosh, it was just a month ago, the building disclosure policy, seventh city in the country. That's basically, it's not a, it's not a rules, it's more of a disclosure where big buildings, about 500 of our biggest buildings, are just going to have to put out there using Energy Star um, Portfolio Manager a nationally recognized tool, science tool, on what their water and, elect and energy consumption is. And guess what? Guess who has to do it the first year? Not them, government. Hennepin County, Minneapolis, the University of Minnesota, again, trying to say we will show the example. It, this will be great, this will be big, um, and we think it'll have a positive impact for everybody, because you know what, by spending less on energy means you can spend more in the local economy, you can employ more people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, anybody know what this is? This is the convention center. Don't you wish you could see it? You know, from down below, you can never see it. So this is 3,000 solar panels on the convention center. Unbelievable. For a long time, fortunately or unfortunately, it was the largest solar system in the state. Thank goodness IKEA, at the beginning of this year, implemented a bigger system. Down in Slayton, Minnesota, they now have a two megawatt system. But just to show that it can be done, I mean, and that it can be done in an urban area. Think of all the flat roofs we have here in the city. It's a great opportunity. We learned a lot. Um, thanks to Excel Energy, we received a $2 million grant to show how, the, how it works and work on it. Um, it's, it's only 5%, though, of the energy we use at the convention center. At the convention center, we've been doing such energy conservation members, or, uh, measures that we're saving over a $1 million a year on um, on energy in that building alone. It's just pretty phenomenal. So the next big sector, transportation and land use. 32% of our greenhouse gas footprint. So another really important area. 
Obviously, we want to drive less, we want to walk, bike, take transit, um, and we want cleaner fuels and more efficient vehicles, which is just amazing to see how fast the fleets have changed when you're driving it on the road now and seeing the smaller vehicles, the amount of hybrids, it really can happen. Um, so here we are, all about biking. For those of we've got about 178 miles of bike lanes in Minneapolis. Very, very proud of that, yep. I, uh, how many people here, I know, don't you just love us in biking? You guess, anybody know what the number one city in the country is for what's called bike score? Yeah. Minneapolis. Yep, guess who number two is? Portland. Portland. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, one of their criteria was hills, so I think Portland lost on that one, so. Um, but we don't want people just biking for the fun. We want people to actually bike to work, to their church, to their grocery store, out to the restaurant to visit their friends. We want to use it as an actual commuting tool. Transit is another great thing. So the LRT from here to the Mall of America is great. Um, 2014, we'll have another line from here to St. Paul. If we're lucky, and it seems to be online, we'll have another line by 2018 out to um, West Hennepin County. But frankly, it, that's not enough. That's not a, it's not fast enough. Um, cities like Denver and everybody else are, are doing their LRT a lot faster. If you look at the Downtown Council, a group of private sector people who have talked about what they want the Downtown Council to look like in 2025, they want to double the amount of people living down there and they want thousands of more jobs. The last thing we want are 50,000 more cars going into downtown. We've got to get transit and it's going to take a lot of work. It makes such sense, doesn't it? It's like, what's the deal? Um, waste and recycling, 4%. So this is important, but it's not like it is for transportation and for buildings. So who here has a blue recycling bin? Yeah. Oh, you guys, I don't. You would think I would have some pull, but I actually, I don't. April 22nd is a big day for um, Minneapolis. That's the day for those of us that don't have the bins, we're gonna start the rollout. It'll take about two weeks, but you know, this spring, everybody will have the single bin. And the, in the areas that have the single bin, recycling rates have gone up 60%. Very, very simple, yep. And so we don't want to just do recycling, we want to actually do more organics collection of the non-recyclable paper and your food waste and yard waste. And we need to, wastewater is something people don't think about. You know, when you flush the toilet, it all goes through this big system run by the Met Council. They're very active in looking at the greenhouse gas emissions, but we need to work on that reduction as well. The final thing, the final working group, we and this is a little bit different, this is unique to, there's only a few cities that have done this so far, is we actually had an environmental justice working group looking at the things that we were coming up to, because you know what? We didn't want to have winners and losers as we implement the Climate Action Plan in Minneapolis. And we think it's really important that this is all about advancing social and environmental equity and that there's a chance to do that. We need to really look at um, where we're putting facilities, where transit lines are going, how we're building things um, we th in, in ways that could harm, especially those communities that are already heavily impacted. We actually think there's a lot of co-benefits in here in terms of job training, and um, ways to reduce people's costs by having good transit systems where people are li least likely to have cars. So we want to do this through this, this lens of embedding equity into everything. So there's a climate action plan. If we did nothing, this is like how we're projected to go for if we didn't have the plan. Here's our, our goal that we talked about and or actually, if you go back, here's based on what the goals are, what you just saw us do. And then here's the target. So we're actually in this plan scheduled to achieve the target by about 4% breathing room, which is probably what we're going to need because it's not going to be a linear line. We're going to have fits and starts depending upon the weather, depending upon actions and what's happened. But that's our goal and we think we can get there. So what's next? So we've got the steering committee and it's reviewing the environmental justice things. They're gonna make their recommendations and it's gonna to go to council in April or May. Wouldn't it be lovely to get it there before Earth Day? I don't know, that's what we're looking for. And then the council will take action. And 
you know, I think there's going to be things in the plan, because we just told you the goals, we didn't get into the strategies, that are going to be controversial. And so we're going to need people's help to get, to get this passed. Um, and so we'd love to have you write letters and send emails and testify on what you think is good and what you think should be better. Um, and we're open to that. The city council will take action, whether they as is or they revise it or they say this is ridiculous and send it back. I don't think they'll do that. Um, but that's just the start, isn't it? It's not about a plan. It's about actually implementing it. So then we have to start implementing the plan, and you have to stay on the city's case and make sure that we report back on whether or not we're meeting our goals. Um, but how can you get involved? So support it, and then support us when we start implementing it, because that's where the rubber hits the road. That's where things become a little bit more uncomfortable. And keep the conversation going. You've learned, you have two of the best state speakers on climate change in the country, in the, in the country, probably, but definitely in the state um, that you got to hear today. And it's just so amazing the amount of information they have. So the more that you can talk about this with your neighbors, your friends, and others is great. There's our website for more information, but what else can you do? This is about you as an individual. So there were great, there were great things downstairs, but start thinking about your own carbon imprint, uh, uh, footprint. Um, who here has had a home energy squad uh, uh, audit? Absolutely, yeah. Thanks to Excel and Centerpoint, who are in the room today for helping us with that program. Phenomenal program. You get an energy audit by experts. And at the same time, they tell you where you're going to have the most savings, what the cost is, what the payback is, and then all the rebates and financing options. And you can call them as you move through the system. They give you tons of free stuff, too. So if you haven't signed up, sign up soon. Um, you can either go downstairs or go to the Center for Energy and Environment's um, website. Drive less, drive smart. It's don't, uh, pretty, pretty standard stuff. Use renewable energy and then waste. How long have we been hearing it? For 25 years, reduce, reuse, recycle. Well, we've got to make it fun and sexy again because it actually is what we're supposed to do, reduce, reuse, re um, recycle. And stay informed and please, please get involved. I'd like to thank you all once again for being here and for all of your great work and all of the great support. I think when I tell people across the country what Minneapolis is doing, the fact that we can talk about numbers and where we're failing and, and we can get people energized, they're just, they're just amazed that I, I have never, in all my years of talking about climate change in Minneapolis, I have never had anybody question me on whether or not it exists. And so many cities just aren't that fortunate. So thank you, thank you all for, for living in the city and, and supporting the city and for all of your great work. And we've heard so much from the city and the state and what's all been going on. And Gail is completely right that we have to be doing our part as well. And that there's so much that we can be doing, not just to support the city and the state in their work, but that we can be doing in our own homes, our own businesses, our own faith communities, gyms, libraries, whatever. And so I wanted to share with you a bit about Mayflower's story. Mayflower Church is a very active Earthwise congregation, and it has a goal of becoming a carbon neutral church building by the year 2030. And so what that means is that where you're sitting right now, this entire building, to be net zero um, carbon use, energy use by the year 2030. And this goal stems from our faith and a place where many good ideas begin, in the hearts of a small group of people who were sitting down in the basement of this church around a table near where all the exhibits were this evening. And the idea began as just a seed of how we as individuals could respond to climate change, and then it just grew into the reality that the work of responding to climate change is not just about individuals, but it's about communities of faith, entire denominations, neighborhoods, cities, states, and nations. And so in 2008, Mayflower wrote a resolution to the United Church of Christ establishing the Earthwise Congregation designation, 
which provides a framework for UCC churches to actively embrace environmental stewardship and respond to climate change. Mayflower became an Earthwise congregation soon after the adoption of the designation in Minnesota and began dreaming about how this congregation could respond to climate change. We've got a dream catcher up here in the sanctuary, which reminds us that we are a dreaming congregation that takes the dreams and puts it into action. And so we first began in the ways most people begin. You, we began living into our Earthwise values in smaller but very important ways with replacement of light bulbs with more energy efficient ones, the installation of bike racks, the placement of more recycling bins, and other actions which allowed us to become more environmentally friendly and lower our carbon footprint. However, with this planet, which we love so dearly and rely on for all of what we have, at currently over 390 parts per million of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere and needing to be at or below 350 parts per million for a sustainable climate, we knew that we need it to go big or risk sacrificing the homes and lives of those individuals and families in areas of the world most immediately impacted by climate change. And the future health and homes of our children right here in Minnesota. We're acting not just out of our faith, but out of our hearts. Because the impacts of climate change can't be denied, as we've seen, they're occurring right in front of our eyes. 2012 was officially the hottest year on record, and it was full of extreme weather patterns, droughts, floods, tornadoes, superstorm Sandy, and that was just the crazy weather patterns here in the United States in one year. As a community of faith, we decided that we could not remain silent in the face of the worst global crisis the world has ever experienced. Mayflower Church, at its core, is a justice-seeking church. And we discovered that everything this church has worked for all the justice issues and all the justice work being performed throughout the world, whether it is religious or secular based, is really put into jeopardy by climate change. We realized if we continue down the path, the default path of using more energy and expending as many greenhouse gases as we wished, that there would be no turning back. Before I went into the ministry, I studied chemistry and mathematics. And let me tell you, physics does not negotiate. <laughs> and it's not going to change its mind about how carbon is processed in the environment. And it's not going to change its mind about how much, how much carbon dioxide the environment can handle. So rather than becoming paralyzed or trying to explain away the situation, Mayflower Church has pledged to be a seed of hope in the midst of the current climate crisis by showing other congregations, individuals, and businesses that living carbon neutral is actually possible. In 2010, we formed a task force and began making strategic plans for how we are going to boldly respond to climate change as a faith community. We engaged our entire congregation in forums, in the work of setting our priorities, and we began putting together a capital appeal to fund the project. Now, I don't know if you know how slow churches can move, <laughs> but that began in 2010. And we're now, and we found that, but we found we didn't need to recreate the wheel. Just because we're a faith community, there is the technology and the knowledge out there for individuals and communities to live carbon neutral. And to help us with our goal of reaching carbon neutral, we decided to first focus on our building 
and use a framework from Architecture 2030, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, independent organization responding to climate change. And you already know why we used our building. All the speakers mentioned why focus on buildings. Because buildings consume more energy than any other area of our lives. According to the US Energy Information Administration, buildings consume nearly half of all energy produced in the United States. And 76% of all the electricity produced in the United States is used just to operate buildings. Furthermore, buildings are the largest contributors to climate change. In 2010, nearly half of the carbon dioxide emissions came from buildings, which makes buildings a huge problem in this climate crisis. And we did not want our place of worship to be a part of the problem, but rather a part of the solution. So to kick off our work, we received a grant for a full-scale energy audit which help us determine not only our baseline, but establish a three-phase plan to get us to carbon neutral by 2030. Each phase contains three pieces. The reduction of energy use, the generation of on-site renewable energy, and the purchase of renewable energy or offsets to cover what we can't reduce or produce ourselves as an already existing building. Two months ago, we completed phase one of our energy efficiency upgrades, which included sealing leaks around the church, a whole blower door test throughout the church, upgrading heating and cooling and control systems, and upgrading building equipment. That was just the energy efficiency piece. There are two other pieces to phase one. We have everything lined up for the installation of 200 solar panels on our roof and are just waiting on one small piece from Excel. And with this in the purchase of offsets totaling no more than 20% of our total energy use to remain in the alliance of the standards of architecture 2030, by the end of this year, we expect to have completed all of phase one and be 60% of the way to carbon neutral. But as we were talking about this in trying to, when we were talking with the congregation, why are we doing this? Is it to lower, just lower our carbon footprint? Is it for the payback? And we decided that the real reason that we were doing it was that we cannot respond to climate change by ourselves. We plan to continue to share our story in working towards responding to climate change in big ways. And we need all of you to join us in this work by getting your social organizations, businesses, faith organizations, gyms, libraries, city buildings to go carbon neutral. Because although climate change is too big for any of us alone. It most certainly is not too big for all of us together. Thank you. Uh, I'm, the, uh, I'm the statistician, if you will, that 40 years ago didn't go through the door to accounting. I went through the door going to climatologist. And uh, some people think that was a, a big mistake. But I've relished working in climate sciences for a long time, most of my adult life, uh, also most of the time here in Minnesota. And uh, so as a Minnesotan, I'm going to talk to you uh, about what's happening, um, as Joan alluded to, out there in our backyard. I might also illustrate with a few examples of what's happening elsewhere. I hope to settle once and for all, those of you that uh, may need to have this issue settled, that the evidence of the measurements of our Earth climate system is absolutely overwhelming that it's changing. And it's changing in a number of attributes that we should pay attention to. Uh, I need to give a little bit of uh, my, my background. Uh, 
I'm the fourth generation of Sealy to live in Minnesota. This is a picture of my great-great-grandfather, Ira Sealy, who was in the territorial legislature in Minnesota from 1854 to 1858, and in fact had his say in writing our state constitution before statehood in 1858. And then he served the state from 1858 to 1862 in the legislature. Uh, reading my great-great-grandfather's papers, I have come to the conclusion that we not only need to share our common knowledge, science, if you will, we need to share our common values because that's what we take action on. And so I want that as a premise for really what operates in the background of what we, uh, really what we cover tonight. Now as a reminder of the uh, point on earth that we live, it is a highly variable point on earth. So what's it been like uh, when Mother Nature has rolled the dice on today's date? Back in 1935, it was 73 degrees out at Pipestone, Minnesota, down in the southwest corner of the state. On March 14, 1897, however, it was minus 40 up at Detroit Lakes. Seems a little extreme, doesn't it, for mid-March? Uh, in 1917, uh, Grand Marais, beautiful part of the state, was getting an 18-inch snowstorm. And in 1943, on this date, uh, the poor city of Wyndham, down in Cottonwood County in southwestern Minnesota, was having an ice storm that left a coating of one to two inches of ice on everything. So uh, you can see what today's date can bring. Uh, so actually driving back from Hutchinson, I was with the Minnesota Foundation Seed Dealers Association in Hutchinson today, and driving back, I couldn't help but think, what a, what a pleasant March 14th it is today. <laughs> so um, as background, I, uh, I, I use this slide a lot. It's not my slide, it's from an eminent uh, atmospheric and climate scientist who's no longer with us named Stan Chagnon from Illinois. But back in the 90s, he framed what I thought was a, a, a great context for how we see climate behavior. Now bear with me, this needs just a little bit of work, but I think it's an important premise for what we're going to talk about. The Earth climate system behaves and, and, and per, human perception of its behavior has varied across time. Our founding fathers, people like Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, believed in kind of a stationary view of climate behavior. That is, if we measured it at a point on Earth for a long enough period of time, we could define its central characters and its annual range, and over enough years we could capture it, its extremes. And then the premise being that after a number of decades, we'd know everything there was to know about climate at that point on Earth. And that was kind of a foundation perception of what climate behavior was like. I'm going to skip the cyclical because it's more uh, uh, relevant in equatorial regions, quite frankly. We don't have much cyclical behavior in our climate. But the variability perception of climate we, we gathered together in the mid-20th century as a modification of the old stationary view, and that simply acknowledged that, yes, with time, we can quantify the central tendencies of our climate, temperature, precipitation, etc. But what we also need to recognize, being a mid-continent climate, is the variability about those central tendencies waxes and wanes. We go through some periods where it seems like we're stuck in a rut, and one year be behaves like the next, like the next, like not like the next. And then other times in our history, each year has tended to behave quite distinctly different from the previous. So the modification of the stationary with the variability perception of climate behavior I think Professor Chagnon made an effective argument. Our country's infrastructure is based on that perception of climate behavior. Our energy, our electric utility grid, our transportation system, our public health system, our architecture, almost all of the infrastructure we rely on for our quality of life 
is fundamentally premised on this perception of climate behavior. We have adjusted that infrastructure for maximum effectiveness and efficiency based on that perception of behavior. The unfortunate circumstance is that perception of climate behavior isn't valid anymore. The trend shift view of climate behavior argues, and quite effectively, and I'll show you some statistics in a minute, that we're now measuring attributes of the climate system that are outside the realm that we have measured historically. And with greater and greater frequency are we measuring these. So that absolutely mandates, absolutely no questions asked, mandates that we adapt our infrastructure. If we don't, we're being pretty dumb about it. Okay? So that's a fundamental premise. The other premise I want to uh, hopefully illustrate for you is despite the deployment of modern technology and living in a very well-developed country on this planet, we have not effectively mitigated our exposure to the consequence of weather and climate events. In fact, the statistics argue quite the contrary. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, along with the insurance industry in this country, keeps track of our economic losses, event by event, year by year. So uh, for a weather event like a landfall hurricane or a tornado or something like that, they tabulate what the economic consequences uh, are both in terms of insured losses and infra infrastructure losses. And they keep tabs on that for uh, climate episodes, droughts, wildfires, things of that nature. They also keep similar statistics. As we run through the course of time, we find that over the last 30 plus years, we have realized a loss of over a trillion dollars in this so-called developed country of ours to the economic consequence of weather events and climate episodes. And we don't even have 2012 depicted here yet. If we just tabulate the losses associated with Superstorm Sandy and 60% of the U.S. landscape being in drought last year, we're already way up on this chart. It's continuing this positive trend. So despite the notion that we don't often talk about our vulnerability to these things in terms of insured and infrastructure consequences, it's very real and unfortunately it's a positive trend. Now in our region, we have three measurable attributes of our climate that are changing beyond, as I alluded to earlier, beyond the realm, beyond the central tendencies of what we've measured statistically in the past. And we're very fortunate in this state. Our climate history of measurement is very rich in this state. Those of you that have read my book know this, but it goes back not only to the 1850s, we can even reconstruct the winter of 1807 in this state based on measurements, not somebody's conjecture. But the three attributes that are changing are temperature, probably the one we hear about the most, somewhat skewed with a seasonality shift in winter, mostly. Uh, water vapor, what we call dew point, those of you that watch the news that's what's commonly reported when they tell us what the dew point is, is how much water vapor is in the air around us. And then this amplified precipitation signal where we're exposed to more season to season and year to year variability. This dovetails for us here in Minnesota nicely with what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has been telling us in their periodically filed reports that there is seasonality in the temperature change on planet Earth. There's a seasonality character to this. And uh, it, you can see by the color coding on the maps here, various seasons have a more profound signature on certain areas of the global landscape. Now in the North American landscape, the one on the lower right here that shows the coloration of uh, more pink and red during the Northern Hemisphere winter, December, January, and February. So not just valid for us here in Minnesota, but valid for North America. 
That's where we're seeing the most pronounced temperature change. It varies depending around the world on what landscape you're looking at, but by no means make the mistake that climate change is uniform. It doesn't have a uniform character to it. It has a disparate character to it, depending on where you're looking. Also, there's even a diurnal shift. There's even a daily shift in terms of the temperature signature. Most mid and high latitude positions on planet Earth, like ours here in Minnesota, are experiencing less and less and less frequency of extraordinarily cold nights. Uh, recall a few weeks ago, Embarrass, Minnesota made the national news because it went to minus 43. Well, my old friend Roland, who's been the observer for life, his whole life at Embarrass, Minnesota, he was probably out barbecuing hamburgers that day. <laughs> because Embarrass typically, typically used to go to minus 50 all the time. Minus 40 is my, mild for them. And it's rare and rare and rare. It's not happening that much anymore. Conversely, extraordinarily warm nights are increasing in frequency. I want you to remember how uncomfortable you were last July 4th, arguably the hottest July 4th in state history. Not because the mercury or the air temperature was up so high, but because the dew point was up so high. We had so much water vapor in the air. So there's our temperature trend. Our statewide temperature trend is upward. The line going through this data, this is pool data for the state as a whole. But as you can see by the slope of the line changing in recent decades, it's even more steeply upward in the last three decades over what it's been over the last hundred years or so. And in fact, the population of years where we've exceeded the 90th percentile statistically is quite a large number of years in the last two decades. Also, during the heating season, when we have to hit, uh, heat our buildings, we've definitely seen a skewed distribution in that the lion's share of recent heating seasons have fallen in the warm part of the historical distribution, with last year being the warmest of all time. Simply stated, last year we had fewer heating degree days in our Minnesota landscape than any previous year in history. Uh, our dew points are upward. We in, in the climate science community define a tropical-like air mass as an air mass that has a 70 degree dew point or higher. That because most of us actually are, are quite uncomfortable when the dew point is 70 degrees. And the slopes are upward for the occurrence of 70 degree dew point air masses in our region. They're upward whether you consider us here at the population center in the Twin Cities or as on the lower graph, you even go all the way up to the Canadian border along the International Falls uh, border with, uh, with Ontario. Because of that, the National Weather Service is having to issue more frequent heat advisories. And again, there's no question about these statistics. They are having to issue more frequent heat advisories. This is when the heat index is going to go to 105 or greater, which of course is helped along by these high dew points. We've had uh, heat index values in our lifetime in this state as high as 134 degrees. Might as well go sit in the sauna. Uh, here's a depiction of the state's precipitation record. And again, you can see the long-term uh, pattern here all the way back to the late 19th century. Again, you can see it's been generally in the surplus range among the population of recent years. Uh, but embedded in that quantity shift in our precipitation is an important character shift. And you've probably heard me talk about this in various venues. The character shift is that more and more of it is coming in the form of intense thunderstorms. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recognized this years ago. In fact, they recognized it for all of these landscapes on the world map that have a blue plus sign with them. So not just us here in the Western Great Lakes region, but a lot of landscapes are seeing the same character shift in their precipitation. We are well anxiously awaiting for the new NOAA Atlas 14 to be uh, produced and available to us later this month because it's going to show us how the recurrence intervals 
are changing for these intense rainstorms. So the five inch rain, the six inch rain, the eight inch rain coming with a higher frequency. That's what it's going to show us. In fact, our former state climatologist Jim Zandlow documented these three cases of 1,000 year flash floods. That's right, I said 1,000 year flash floods. Three of them in southeastern Minnesota since the year 2004. So something's wrong with our statistics. Right, we've got to recalculate what a thousand year flood is. <laughs> but uh, because, the, the, because quantitatively we're getting more precip, but we're also getting it in thunderstorms, it also means that some areas of the landscape get left out. So indeed, we are experiencing drought in recent decades with a higher frequency. We've had eight, in a, eight years in a row, eight summers in a row where we've had severe to extreme drought surface somewhere on the Minnesota landscape. And that's unfortunate. It's also been quite consequential. In fact, last year, here's the example. Last year, at the same point in time, we had 55 Minnesota counties color-coded on this map, declared by USDA for drought disaster and drought disaster relief. And in the same time period, we had 11 counties with the crosses embedded there that were designated by FEMA as federal flood disaster counties and eligible for federal uh, flood disaster assistance. So lastly, consequentially, the, the data I have showed you the data from our Minnesota State Database are playing out consequentially in a variety of ways that many of us have observed and several of us at the university community have documented. So we see that uh, there's been changes in the plant hardiness zones where we can grow uh, plants. We now have zone five in the state of Minnesota. Uh, there's been a uh, shorter duration, our lakes and soils are freezing. Last year, all 60-some uh, percent of our inland lakes lost ice the earliest date on the calendar in history. Uh, anyway, there's a variety of things, insect, pa uh, plant pathogens, a number of biological organisms that once had high mortality, they're surviving our winter. Uh, the opportunities abound for invasive species to take hold here. We have the new Invasive Species Research Center that just opened at the University of Minnesota St. Paul campus. We've had tremendous numbers of freeze-thaw cycles wrecking our roads and highways because we used to not fluctuate around the freezing mark quite so much as we do in the modern era. Uh, public health consequence. We've had not, the, not only the heat waves in summer I referred to, but we have longer mold and allergen seasons. So our, patients, our patient loads in our healthcare facilities stay high for longer periods of time. And of course, we've got our work to do on flood and erosion mitigation, and we're trying to put more effort. So that's how the data I showed you have played out in our lifetime, and I don't expect this to suddenly reverse itself. That's not the way climate operates. It's not going to reverse itself. So these are some items for you to contemplate. Uh, feel free to use any of these as evidence when you uh, make uh, some cases with your own institutions, your own friends, your own neighborhoods, etc. All the data are available to you. Uh, and uh, feel free to contact me if you uh, want to amplify any of these points. But I hope, hope I've laid a little groundwork for discussion later at least in showing what the data are telling us. Thank you very much.